Good morning and most welcome to Heidegger 1166. We are currently recording here in center of Gothenburg, Trägorsföreningen, and it seems to be a very <laughs> lovely day coming up. Sunshine, and oddly enough, for September, we are, I think we're counting the 18th of September, is that correct? It's not a single cloud. I've never seen that before. Well, let's get on to it. I will at least start with Henry Staff and see where it takes us. So I was just getting into Laplace before. <coughs> and this is from Henry Stapp. Quantum and free will, and his orthodox interpretation, or rather sticking to the orthodox interpretation of von Neumann, not compromising the observational data, so to speak, but keeping to what has been learned from the contact with nature. So, the still, close to Copenhagen and Brussels, page 23 in his book. <coughs> Excuse me. The close agreement of the resulting theory with the normal objective empirical data is certainly a bottom line success. But standard quantum theory describes via process one also the dynamical connection between a person's mentally instigated actions and that person's consequent mental perceptions of material responses to those actions. Any putative alternative non-standard quantum theory that fails to provide a rational theory of these more subjective aspects of the mind-brain connection is fundamentally deficient compared to the standard quantum mechanics. Very interesting. It was the assumed possibility for an ideal observer to know in principle, simultaneously, both the location and the momentum of every particle in the universe that allow Laplace to deduce from the materialist principles of classical mechanics the determinism of the material world. And hence, within the framework of classical mechanics, the impossibility of a causal intervention of anything not fully characterized by its material properties. But that whole notion of the cause all this for a second, sorry. But that whole notion of the causal closure of the physical fails in a world where the mind-dependent quantum dynamical rules prevail. So Laplace had his famous dialogue with uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. I think it was one year before the turn of the century. <coughs> And Napoleon was shocked, absolutely gobsmacked, when he asked Laplace, where is God? And Laplace answered, there is no need for that hypothesis. That Laplace even dared to say it, well, that's honor him. Because 
the emperor could have ha have had him executed. But I would say more interesting, that was the only conclusion to be made, as Laplace did, until the event 1925 of Heisenberg. And then we knew Laplace and the foundation, rather, that he was working on, unbeknownst to himself, to be the fault wrong, always wrong. So two interesting dates, maybe 1799, 1800, and then 125 years later. Changing of world views. What is even more interesting is a third could be added, and that was that Laplace implicitly had a third hypothesis that everything could be fixed in time and space. But everyone until that moment assumed that that was the natural way of things. And I would add, it was also the natural order of things to a certain extent already uh, before 1689 and Descartes. They were making their conclusions from a foundation. They were only already firmly standing on. <coughs> we do not directly perceive atomic particles. We perceive only big macroscopic systems that are built out of combinations of large numbers of atomic particles. And there are associated physical fields. Quantum mechanics has a well-defined, has well-defined rules for combining many atomic particles together to make big objects and systems and to represent in mathematical language the purely mechanical process too. Aspect of the evolution of those macroscopic systems. So very important to remember. I, I could take some coffee, I think. Just pour, pour a little coffee on it. Closer to the microphone, because it's the wind. This is important to understand. There are two processes going on after Heisenberg. Process one and two. Thank you. And we are, until Henry Stapp and Carlo Rovelli and others, Julian Barber, not to be forgotten. Uh, we are forgetting the process one. And this is as hard to get around. It's a tough pill to swallow, <laughs> to say the least. A big physical object, although, oops, although perceived classically perceived in classically describable terms is not causally governed by the laws of classical physics a big physical object although perceived in classically describable terms is not causally governed by the laws of classical physics It can be described, but it is not governed. That makes the whole difference. It must be treated as a conglomeration of its atomic constituents in order to account for its physical properties. 
such as rigidity and electrical conductivity. Yet, if it's treated as a conglomeration of its atomic quantum mechanical constituents evolving in accordance with process 2 alone, then it will not have in general and most specifically when it is a measuring device a classically describable location and shape. Process 2 generates a quantum state that represents a sum called a mixture of a continuum of potential possible worlds of the type that we can actually perceive or experience but not, does not specify which elements or set of elements in this continuum will be actualized if someone looks. This mixture of potentialities is sometimes called a smear of potentialities. Thus, the quantum mechanical state of the macroscopic pointer on a measuring device is by virtue of the process to evolution smeared out over a continuous collection of potential locations along the dial. But that whole smear is not what is perceived if someone looks. It is the mind-dependent process 1, not the mind-independent process 2, that resolves the question of what our actual experiences are. <coughs> process 2 evolution includes the interaction of the system of interest with the surrounding environment but that environmental decoherence effect falls far short of specifying what an observer will experience perceive if he looks it is process one not mere env environmental decoherence that provides that needed result. As earlier described, this process one first selects from the process two generated continuum of potentialities a particular A particular perception that might, might is important, might occur. Then nature chooses, subject to the statistical born rule, either to accept the possibility selected by the observer and then actualize the global consequences of that acceptance, or actualize the global consequences of rejecting the observer's proposal. So two ways. The above description decomposes the standard VN description of an event that can involve all at once a large set of possibilities into an ordered sequence of possibilities each involving a single yes and no question as in the 
game of 20 questions. Thus, the whole large set of questions can be considered to be posed one by one with no passage of physical time. Very important. Time does not pass until a yes response eventually appears. To put it in example, in the Roger Penrose Wimbledon game, there are two aspects. We have Roger Federer involved in the collapsing of the superposition and we have the spectator. There would be two different things. The spectator will have the after one where all potentialities have already collapsed but there is no temporal passing of time. The beforeness of Roger Federer is not in time. Very important. They happen absolutely simultaneous to the time that one can say later gets created. It's a bit of an exaggeration. That's true. can also see this is okay as uh, the sentence I've just read thus the, the whole large set of questions can be considered to be posed one by one it is okay to see it that way but there is no passage of physical time until a yes response eventually appears it's absolutely okay way to see the whole thing and that there are literally 20 questions or more. This is the graspable formulation proposed by Wheeler. It's equivalent to the standard one and more easily converted to the relativistic version demanded by RQFT. That letter version of the theory requires that a particular 3D global instant now be defined in association with each of nature's yes or no responses and that the associated global collapse be instituted along that 3D surface. which divides 4D space-time into an associated past and an associated future. By means of the two processes, process 1 and 2, the standard Copenhagen von Neumann approach elevates our inner mental selves, our egos, from passive spectators to active agents. From this orthodox quantum mechanical perspective, the basic difficulty with putative 
materialistic versions of quantum mechanics that leave our human mental choices out of the dynamics is that they leave the theory burdened with one, our useless conscious processes, two, a quantum mechanically evolving world with no means for selecting from the process to generated quantum smears of possibilities. What are actual perceptions will be so we have no manner of choosing if we accept the materialist viewpoint we become people I would say under dust man we become not authentical inauthentical people And that clash, that distance between myself, my soul, my ego, and the outer world, is shown by Eisenberg and von Neumann, and of course Henry Staff, to be a random cut. So it doesn't have any sense to it even. This is what process one and process two describes. Yes, I know it's difficult to fathom, but what it shows is the cut between mind and body, or mind and world, cannot be made in that fashion that was assumed. It doesn't make any sense in quantum mechanics. Adding to this, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So it's, it's dynamite, it's TNT, because that the view of the cut is accepted worldwide, or at least in the Western Hemisphere. It is not opposed by many philosophers, very few. The later Wittgenstein, Heidegger, could be Derrida. It is not opposed by, for instance, the churches of the world none of them they all by default without choosing of course like Laplace and I guess Napoleon so he was pretty shocked <laughs> there is <laughs> noted <laughs> so it is hot stuff but it does comply with the orthodox quantum mechanical interpretation. Whereas the ordinary view of, let's say, mainstream quantum mechanics today does not comply, and they would also not deny it. There will be no denial of that. It's very important for you who watch that. There is no argument on this case. They abandoned it for good reasons, practical reasons shut up and calculate if you remember from earlier lectures but that does not mean it is true I think it has become true by default Moreover, the denial of the causal potency of our mental efforts is blatantly contradicted empirically by the ubiquitous experiences of everyday life. The materialists claim that this experiential basis of our lives is an illusion. Sabine Hossenfelder. She said of it. You remember four lectures ago, she literally put her foot down and said that ordinary life is an illusion. And she used an example of parallel lines. 
20 lines that look not parallel but are and thereby she showed our ordinary experience is an illusion cannot be trusted it's actually the same conclusion as Plato a slightly different reason but it's not required the materialists claim that this experiential basis of our lives is an illusion rings hollow when the theory that makes this claim is found to be false and is replaced by a hugely successful theory in which the ubiquitous daily experiences of the causal power of our mental intentions in the world of matter is rationally explained. <coughs> the standard Copenhagen von Neumann approach. The aforementioned smearing difficulty in the standard quantum approach by bringing into the dynamics something beyond the Schrödinger equation, namely the probing actions of the observing agents. <laughs> the probing query might be, will my up upcoming experience be that of the pointer of the measuring device lying between five and 501 on the dial. A yes response on the part of nature consists of nature's delivering to the observer the query defined possible experience and reducing the quantum state of the entire universe to the part of its prior self compatible with that yes response. A no answer will result in a corresponding reduction but no immediate experiential feedback. This omission leaves room for another query to be posed with no passage of physical time. Thus, millions of no's can be produced by nature with or little or no passage of measured physical time. The primary reality assumption in this realistically interpreted orthodox quantum field theory that I am describing is that the evolving quantum state the so-called density matrix of the universe is an element of reality. The behavior of this quantum state is concordant with the idea that it represents, as Heisenberg and the philosopher North, Alfred North Whitehead have emphasized a collection of potentialities for future experiences. This quantum potentiality normally evolves according to the definite process too, but in order to become an actuality, a potentiality must be actualized by some other process and the future is thus considered to be open. In contrast, a future classical possibility is mechanically predetermined to happen or not to happen already at the birth of the universe thereby 
precluding any possibility that our mental intentions and efforts can make any difference in what happens to our physical bodies. So in the change, where there's a yes or a no, the no will change everything that happened before, so to speak, to make it look determinate and it will fit with the materialistic universe. But it's this changing process that is not covered in the standard materialistic theory. So, in a sense, one could say this is an extra dimension. Not covered, but should be covered according to the orthodox quantum mechanical interpretation. In contrast, a future classical possibility is mechanically predetermined to happen or not happen already at the birth of the universe. I think this is good. In von Neumann's formulation, the purely atomic physics-based dynamical process, process two, does not fail because the system is big. It fails because the atom-based aspects of the dynamics are only part of the causal theory. The causal deterministic unitary process two is disrupted by the non-unitary process one and its perceptual observations which therefore have causal effects upon the physical material world that are not caused by the purely matter-based process two. Thus, materialism fails. That is the purely matter of the church. The purely matter-based process two evolution fails when that evolution comes into causal contact with the material correlates of our subjective experiences, which are the neural or brain correlates of our subjective experiences of probing and perceiving. No other failure of process two is mentioned. So that's the only mentioning of a failure of process two. And that is also very pertinent to the business. It doesn't take away so much. Von Neumann spends a lot of time and effort reducing the quantum, quantum mathematics to properties of so-called projection operators. These can be directly related to experiments that have just two alternative possible results, yes or no, which can be associated with whether or not an observer perceives a specified response or fails to perceive such a response to his probing action. This association allows well-defined connections to be formed between von Neumann's mathematics and observer perceptions. If the answer is yes, then the specified perception occurs. If the answer is no, then no perception occurs. For no perception can be all the perceptions other than the specified one, only the specified one.
This rule allows many immediate no responses, responses to be delivered by nature before the one yes in a multiple choice question. The purely mechanical atom-based process 2 evolution fails when a measuring process is performed due to the overriding character of the process 1 action. <coughs> Orthodox quantum mechanics is, is thus basically a description of this causal dynamical interaction between our conscious minds which carry our perceptions and our material atom-based brains which contain the brain correlates of our probing actions and responding perceptions. The earlier classical mechanics is constitutionally unable to accommodate the 20th century empirical data. But the most elemental and ubiquitous source of empirical data is one's own daily experiencing of the ability of one's mental efforts to influence one's bodily actions, who has not witnessed the intense struggle of the newborn infant to learn, by trial and error, which mental effort produces which perceived bodily response. To classify this first-hand empirical data as an illusion, in order to salvage a theory that is known to be fundamentally false and false in a way that is essentially an incorrect understanding of the connection between our conscious experiences and the brain counterparts is neither rational nor scientific. The quantum resuscitation of the causal power of our thoughts overturns the absurd classical notion that nature has endowed us with conscious minds whose only power and function is to delude us into believing that it is helping us to create a future that advances our felt values. <laughs> while in actuality that future was predetermined 15 billion years ago. <coughs> Realistically interpreted orthodox quantum theory thus provides us with a non-materialistic science-based understanding of our own intrinsic nature. It is a theory that accounts with spectacular accuracy for the structure of the empirical facts about the external world discovered by atomic physicists during the 20th century. Many competent physicists struggled unsuccessfully for a quarter of a century to comprehend those facts in every imaginable, imaginable way concordant with a materialistic worldview. Until Heisenberg, in 1925, lifting that restriction, 
but clinging, clinging to the principle that the new theory should be built upon observables and hence in some way upon us as observers broke the logjam in such a decisive way that Pauli, <coughs> Born, Jordan and others immediately jumped on board. Einstein already in 28 nominated Born, Heisenberg, Jordan for the Nobel Prize which was awarded to Heisenberg in 1932. The stranglehold of materialism was broken simply by the need to accommodate empirical data of atomic physics but the ontological ramification went far deeper into the issue of our own human nature and the power are all thoughts to influence our psychophysical future. <coughs> the measuring process. The final chapter of von Neumann's book is entitled The Measuring Process, but the topic the real topic, so to speak, is us and our acquisition of knowledge. The core message of quantum mechanics, in the words of Niels Bohr, is in the drama of existence, we are ourselves both actors and spectators. It is our influence on our acts of acquiring knowledge that allows us actors to transform a quantum world of potentialities into actualities that are expressions of our values. It is these consequences of our probing actions that give meaning to our lives. utility of quantum smearing. The feature of quantum mechanics that converts us from puppets to protagonists is quantum smearing. This property stems directly from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It allows our minds to be more than mere cogs in a giant machine or helpless witnesses to events they cannot affect. Quantum smearing gives us important things to do and the dynamical laws of orthodox quantum mechanics endow our minds with the power to do them. Einstein offers a helpful example of the quantum smearing. Suppose a single radioactive nucleus is placed in a sphere and surrounded by a decay detecting de device that when activated by the decay of the nucleus sends a signal to a mechanism that causes a pan to make a lip or a spike on a moving scroll. Application of the quantum analog of the classical laws of motion, namely the process to Schrodinger equation, causes the physical blip to occur not, not just at one single place on the moving scroll, but at a continuum of locations. Each corresponding to a possible time at which the nucleus 
might decay. If we then follow via process to the flow of information about the quantum state of the blip containing scroll into the brain of the observer, we find that the brain will contain for each blip location in the quantum sphere the neural correlate of the perception of the very location of that blip. But the observer will actually perceive the blip to lie at a single small portion of the smear of possibilities. Thus, process two cannot be the full story. According to orthodox quantum theory, the dynamical partner of process two, namely process one, inserts to the evolution of quantum states and action a collapse that is instigated and partially specified by the mind of the observer. Thus, the observer's mind or ego is actively involved in reducing the quantum smear of potential perceptions to the single perception that an observer actually experiences. Like here, I experienced only this. Without these smears, there will be nothing for us to do. Everything would be preordained, as in classical mechanics. Moreover, the important concept of probability enters into the quantum dynamics precisely at the process one action of reducing the smear of potential perceptions to the one, the one here, that is actually experienced. Without the prior smear of possibilities, there will be no place or role for quantum probabilities. We are faced at this point with a deep problem in one way or another that has cha challenged philosophers since the beginning of philosophy, namely the problem of the nature of the connection of our conscious thoughts and perceptions to the material world. Now, however, we are armed with a highly developed mathematical structure that is focused precisely on this issue. As Dirac remarked in the preface to his 1930 book, this state of affairs is very satisfactory from a philosophical point of view as implying an increasing recognition of the part played by the observer in himself introducing the regularities that appear in these observations. And a quote from Dirac. Von Neumann starts his discussion on the measuring process by emphasizing that we generally inform ourselves about the physical world by means of perceptions of properties of systems located at some finite distance from our bodies. The pertinent perceptual information about the system being examined is transported to our brains by a sequence or chain of intermediate physical systems. Von Neumann illustrates this point by describing a situation in which the information 
about the temperature of liquid in a container is transferred to the observer's brain by a path that goes first to a thermometer, a column of mercury, then to a beam of light, then to the retina, then to the optical nerve, etc. And finally to a brain structure that is the neural or brain correlate of the observer's knowledge. Each physical system in the chain can, under certain specified conditions described below, be regarded as part of a good measuring device that transmits the key perceptual information from input system to output system without significant loss. This is also very close to the Alice and Bob experiment. Alice, Bob and Alice's friend and Bob's friend. Could I have some more tea, please? Sorry. My throat is still sort of dry. Quantum mechanics focuses primarily on relationships between our various perceptions and it is the faithful mapping of the perceptual structure to equivalent forms along the chain that is of immediate interest here. An adopted principle of psychophysical parallelism an adopted principle of psychophysical parallelism, parallelism asserts that this faithful perceptual chain is accompanied by a parallel quantum mechanically described chain that carries the associated probabilistic information. Von Neumann developed a detailed quantum model of a good measuring device. If one considers a pair of swim, a simple quantum system as a single new quantum system and places it in a so-called pure state, then the one-to-one -one mapping between the states of the two subsystems, input and output, that is needed for a good measuring device will prevail. Thus, in our example, the information about the blips on the scroll will be carried step by step to associated features of the brain of the observer. Most importantly, the quantum mechanically described chain that parallels the perceptual chain will ensure that the statistical weights associated with the different possible perceptions will be preserved. That is, there is a probability preserving mapping of the perceived aspects of the external perceived scene to corresponding aspects of the brain of the perceiver. Wow, that's great. You really explicate one of the hardest problems here, and that's the correspondence between the experienced thing caused by process two and the brain state, and how they equal each other, but also shows with the von Neumann interpretation and Heisenberg of 1925, we add the process one. And that additive will make it clear that there are actually two dual things going on. And I like it particularly because this is the 
equivalence of the wave particle duality. This is the equivalence in cause and effect. It parallels that in a very nice way. And it helps to explain particle or wave because that is something you have to work with for a long time. I assume was that that was the case with me. But realizing that the potential wave is rather similar to process one and the process two is almost like the particle. There are differences, it's not on the same level, so to speak, but I see parallels here. So I think those could be helpful. The process one action that occurs in the observer's brain can thus be mapped and listen now backward in time, outward in space. That always happens backward in time. Why? It is because of the double slit split experiment. And that is a tough nut to crack. One way, there is no time before, after. After is time. Remember what I said about Roger Penrose and Roger Federer. After we have time. But the collapse is simultaneous both for the process one and process two. The second one, which I usually use, is just sticking to the double slit experiment. You can see with your own eyes something is going back in time. And that empirical thing is for me as an engineer something safer to keep on. I can see it. You can actually see this. It's perceivable, observable. The process one action that occurs in the observer's brain can thus be mapped backward in time and also important outward in space. The Vila de Witt equation now space and time are becoming. Now it's happening via this chain of good measurements to a faithful image of the process one action occurring in the observer's brain to any one of the measuring systems along the chain. And ultimately out to the blips on the moving scroll. Can we take one last paragraph for a summary and going over to the next subject here? <coughs> I think a step should be taken in steps. The movable Heisenberg cut. <coughs> As already explained, quantum mechanics, unlike its classical forerunners, adopts the view that science is properly, properly about our knowledge of the underlying matter-based reality. Not directly about that material reality itself. And Heisenberg's key 1925 discovery was that in the quantum universe these two parts of nature differ in very important ways. According to quantum mechanics, the mathematical Hilbert space structure of the underlying atom-based reality is very different from the mathematical 
4D space-time structure of our conscious perceptions of that reality. Hence, a person's mind cannot simply perceptually grasp directly the structure of the underlying quantum reality because the quantum mechanical structure of an observer's brain is incommensurate with the classically describable structure of that person's perceptions. Some mind-brain linking process is indeed needed. In order to deal with this central problem in a rationally coherent and practically useful way, Heisenberg proposed that we conceptually divide reality into two separate parts. One, an atomically constituted and quantum mechanically described observed system and two, a perceptually constituted and classically described observing system. Von Neumann's proof shows that we can, in each observation, shift the placement of the Heisenberg cut between these two parts to any chosen position along the tower of linked measuring systems that connect the perceived system to its correlate in the observer's brain without altering the statistical weights of the various alternative possible outcomes of that observation. One can consider the predictions of the mind-matter transitions to occur at any link in the chain of devices without altering the predictions of the theory. The proof rests firmly on the postulate that the basic course of dynamics is specified by the orthodox quantum dynamics. Even though the conscious perceptions are experienced and described in terms of the classical mechanical concepts, von Neumann describes the situation thusly. Now quantum mechanics describes events which occur in the observed portion of the world so long as they do not interact with the observing portion with the aid of process 2 but as soon as such an interaction occurs i.e. a measurement it requires an application of process 1. <coughs> this means that in the subsystem in the tower that lie external or below the Heisenberg cut one can use for the individual perceivable possible outcomes their quantum mechanical descriptions which specify their individual statistical weights but above the Heisenberg cut, including the brain itself, one can use the perceptual description. Me looking at the garden, this actual experience. Our capacity as theorists to choose which description to use where is essential because we do not know the detailed quantum counterparts of our various possible perceptions. 
but yet we need to know the statistical weights in order to be able to make statistical predictions about the various alternative possible experiential outcomes of our alternative possible probing actions. This statistical information is available to us theorists, theorists precisely because we are able to use the experiential perceptual description in the brain side or upper side of the Heisenberg cut. But the quantum description which carries the statistical weights of the perceptual possibilities on the external objective lower side of the cut which contain the perceived physical system. The two descriptions are two aspects of one possible response to the quantum proving action. In parentheses, something I performed on a daily basis, on a minute basis, on a nanosecond basis. I do it all the time. The probability that the blip will appear in a specified small region on the scroll is determined by the decay rate of the radioactive nucleus. The exponential decay process causes different statistical weights to be assigned to decays occurring during different possible time intervals. The probability for the blip to appear in any small time interval will fall off with time as the source decays. Because the scroll is moving, the probability will fall off also with the shift of the location of the blip on the scroll. So the probabilities of different possible perceptions of the blip location are unambiguously specified by the locations of the blips out there on the scroll where they can later be perceived by the observer, any observer, all observer. This is page 33. I'll stop there. <coughs> and we'll come to a summary here. It goes to show how it can be that the world is exactly measurable, exactly definable, but at the same time, that is process two, but at the very same time, if we follow the experimental results, that will mean that there is another process, process one, a process we can perceive, see, in the double slit experiment, for instance, there are others. That shows that there is a correlation backward in time, always, and that eradicates the other answers, the other questions, the other potentialities that I put in my head or in my body system. And I would say this is very, very close to the description of Dasein in Heidegger. And in the next lecture, I will go into that. I think this is something that can open up the understanding of Dasein because the Heisenberg cut, its movable structure, is very akin to Dasein. It is not a definite subject. It is not a definite subject object. It flies in between and afterwards, not in time, but after, they will solidify in Heidegger, they will solidify and become beings, Zeyendens, but before we have 
sign. The same we have here, we have process two. This is the collapse. This is what I see. Beautiful today since it's sunny. But this is an actual experience. It has collapsed into this. It's shared by you, I hope, and by Kali, who's on my side, and any other passerbys who might stroll here. And it will also be shared by camera. But there is another process going on, and that is process one. And that is the most important, I would say, because that is the before. And that is what makes this possible. Not only is it an additive, this actual experience, and here it's an absolute parallel to Heidegger, this actual experience cannot combine without being, without the before, without the pre-structure, as Heidegger calls it. I will not get to philosophic, philosophical here. Yeah, Kalle. What, what do you mean with Heisenberg's cut? What is meant by with the, the yeah, cut? Yeah, it's the cut between the subject and the object, so, oh, so okay, to speak. Okay, okay. So, so where you define where do I stop and where did the other things stops. And that is actually much easier to understand in Heidegger than here, because this is a tough one. But here I was helped by Heidegger, and therefore uh, we we'll make a pause here, I will take some other subject up, but after that I will make a sign lecture, da sign lecture, because there is an obvious connection here. Uh, just a little pause here and we continue here and I will add the observer here and have a deeper look into him. There has been uh, the last decade, I would say, extensive research into something called neurodynamics. And this is the flip side of what I mentioned from Henry Stepp earlier. This is looking to the observer position and using chaos theory, fractality, and also finders from quantum physics look at the quantum state in our systems as a whole. So Henry Stapp explained that there is ours as observers makes the process one terminate in process two by the 20 questions or how many questions there are. In the end, it's just one question and one answer. Collapse. And then we have process two. Here, we're looking on the other side from the observer. And the similar things are happening on that one, as Henry Stapp indicated. But it would be interesting to see how do they sort of what terminology. This is a, an article from um, Article 5. Uh, this is an article from uh, Cognitive Science. It's written by Harold Ants Bachmer and Stefan Rotter. And I read in the abstract. I'll try to add a sort of summary and explanation afterwards. Uh, the dynamics of neural systems. Briefly, neurodynamics has developed into an attractive and influential research branch within neuroscience. In this paper, we discuss a number of conceptual is issues in neurodynamics that are important for an appropriate interpretation
and evaluation of its results. We demonstrate the relevance for the selected topics of theoretical and empirical work. In particular, we refer to the notions of determinacy and stochastic. In neuro neurodynamics across levels of microscopic, mesoscopic and macroscopic descriptions, the issue of correlations between neural, mental and behavioral states is also addressed in some detail. We propose an informed discussion of conceptual foundations with respect to neuro neurobiological results as a viable step to a fruitful future philosophy of neuroscience. A major driving force behind the attention that neuroscience has received in recent decades is the deep must mystery how cognition, perception and behavior are related to brain activity. Many scientists have been fascinated by the wealth of empirical data for individual neurons neural assemblies, brain areas, and related psychological and behavioral features, and by progressively powerful computational rules and tools to simulate corresponding cortical networks. At the same time, the interested public has been attracted by fancy illustrations of brain activity and by pretentious claim of neural solutions to basic philosophical problems, i.g. between free will versus determinism in popular magazines and newspapers. However, Heaps of data, extensive simulations, pretty pictures and bold statements cannot replace the insights that is inevitable to relate the available, available facts to one another in an intelligible fashion. We are talking about the old-fashioned stance that understanding is the ultimate goal of scientific effort. In this respect, the need for a profound conceptual basis in the neurosciences begin to be recognized. The pioneering philosophical foundations of neuroscience by Bennett and Hacker is an outstanding example also in the sense that it is still a singular example. It is uncontroversial that experiments and numerical works is and will remain mandatory for scientific progress, but it can only unfold its full value if it is embedded within a conceptually sound theoretical framework. Conceptual clarifications like this and quite a few more form the material, pres uh, form the material presented in section 2. We should add that a fundamental philosophical distinction of basic significance for many other notions in this paper is that of ontic and epistemic descriptions. <coughs> The distinction emphasizes 
whether we understand the state of a system and its dynamics as it is itself ontic or as it turns out to be epistemic this is vaguely parallel, uh, process one and two as mentioned a formal approach is chosen for the benefit of precision to define and refine the necessary terms as a rule each subsection is succeeded by notes which presents background information interpretive difficulties or references to the neurobiological scenarios discussed subsequently in section 3 from determinacy to stochastic stochasticity stochasticity is another word for statistical influence or statistical inference statistical inference and this is what used normally today in classical physics and the classical interpretation if i may so uh, made by sabine hossenfelder hawking et al and many others in this section we introduce some elementary notions that are crucial for an informed discussion of determinacy and stochastic stochasticity but are often used with vague associations or badly defined specifications we use the term determinatedness and determinism to distinguish between the determinacy of state of a system and its dynamics by way of characterizing these terms we address closely re related terms such as error and variation causation and prediction which serve important purposes particular in the description of complex system and we outline the notion of st stochasticity randomness chance and the role that probability plays in the context go to the chase here let us now illustrate and delineate three notions of determinism causation and prediction by three historical quotations from Laplace Maxwell and Poincaré all are free heroes in one go one in three three in one in a famous quotation in the preface preface to his Essai philosophique sur la probabilité. Laplace addresses a distinctively ontic type of determinism. We ought to regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its antecedent state and as the cause of that state that is to follow. An intelligence knowing all the forces acting in nature at a given instant as well as the momentary position of all things in the universe would be able to comprehend 
in one single formula the motions of the largest bodies as well as the lightest, lightest atoms in the world, provided that its intellect were sufficiently powerful to subject all data to analysis. To it nothing would be uncertain, nothing would be uncertain. The future as well as the past would be present in its eye, and that is of course the eyes of the Laplacian demon, I would say. Well, yeah, <laughs> the intelligence in question became known as Laplace's demon. Its capa capabilities reached beyond the epistemic realm of empirical observation and knowledge. <coughs> Moreover, Laplace presumes a director term, a director time, just a little bit of coffee. A director time when talking about cause and effect. Such a time concept is transcendent in the last two lines of the quotation, which refers to a type of determinism more general and causation. So it's a more general determinism than causation, which is rather specific. More, and a, more than half a century later, in 1873, Maxwell delivered an address at Cambridge University concerning the debate between determinism and free will, in which he said, It is a metaphysical doctrine that from the same antecedents, antecedents follow the same consequences. No one can gainsay this, but it is not of much use in the world like this, in which the same antecedents never again occur, and nothing ever happens twice. The physical axiom which has, has a somewhat similar aspect is that from like antecedents follow like consequences. But here we have passed from absolute accuracy to a more or less rough approximation. There are certain classes of phenomena in which a small error in data only introduces a small error in result. There are, however, other classes of phenomena which are more complicated and in which cases of instability may occur. End of quote. Maxwell clearly distinguishes ontic and epistemic descriptions as based on the notions of stability and uncertainty in this quote. His focus is on causation though. His argument is of antecedents and consequences in the sense of cause, causes and effects. If they are understood as ontic states at earlier and later times, the statement from the antecedents follow like consequences characterize a strong version of causation which is for instance not applicable to chaotic systems exhibiting sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Under such conditions a weak version of causation is relevant. I do not contradict the metaphysical ontological statement from the same antecedents follow the same consequences. In the framework of strong causation, small changes 
in the initial conditions for a process can only result in small changes after any amount of time. Weak causation includes the possibility that small changes in the initial conditions are amplified as a function of time, such that same consequences can only be obtained by same incidents. And now we slip on to the successor of Maxwell and Laplace, Poincaré. He wrote in 1908, If we know exactly the laws of nature and the situation of the universe at the initial moment, we could predict exactly the situation of that same universe at succeeding moment. But even if it were the case that the natural laws had no longer any secret for us, we could still only know the initial situation approximately. If that enabled us to predict the succeeding situation with the same approximation, that is all we require and we should say that the phenomenon had been predicted and that it is governed by laws. But it is not always so. It may happen that small differences in the initial conditions produce very great ones in the final phenomena. A small error in the former will produce an enormous error in the latter. Prediction becomes impossible. End of quote. Here the issue of prediction is addressed explicitly. It obviously has an epistemic meaning and the, at the end of the quote and appears to be somewhat confused with ontic arguments in its beginning. If we know exactly, allude to Laplace's demon with its ontic realm of relevance, but it is immediately mixed up with causation, that is initial conditions and succeeding moments, and epistemic predictability, we could predict. <coughs> Conclusion. Both Maxwell and Poincaré refer to what is today known as deterministic chaos. The behavior of chaotic systems in this sense is governed by deterministic equations, yet it is not predictable to arbitrarily high accuracy. In the theory of nonlinear dynamical systems, completely unpredictable behavior <coughs> is characterized by a diverging entropy. In contrast to the efficient causation, the notion of formal causation is often used to refer to the conditional logical propositions, so-called implications, rather than temporal cause and effect relations. In particular situations, logical reasons may be translatable into temporal causes. But in general, this is not the case if, for instance, a fundamental law is regarded to be the reason for the behavior of a system. This is clearly an, an temporal statement. So they are saying exactly the same as Henry Stamp. The decision is atemporal. After that, time starts, so to speak. After the tennis serve of Roger Federer on the tennis court in Wimbledon in front of thousands of spectators 
and of course televised all over the world simultaneously the superposition is collapsed but one is in process one and the others all the spectres are in process two in one singular joined reality or same reality so to speak and this tendency to have only the second one, the view of the spectator, is more or less shared by Laplace, Maxwell and Poincaré. Although interestingly, I had to put in parenthesis, Poincaré paved the way for chaos theory. Without his discovery, uh, I think the very fast development in chaos theory that like, there was sown after Lawrence and Mandelbrot wouldn't have been possible. So it's very interesting. He might have made that step. Uh, so, um, so these three mathematicians, uh, we could say that uh, perhaps only the last one, uh, Poincaré, he, okay, neither, neither of them, I said the three, but only they wanted free will they wanted free will but that, of course there was no room for it mm. and uh, I think all wants free will maybe not Sabina Hossenfelder but it's very hard to get into the system and uh, shown clearly I have to mention also they are mainly physicists and but they're also mathematicians <laughs> of course <laughs> In the work, I won't go into the whole thing, but what is taken up here in this article is that we are also an indeterminate system that follow the roots of process one and process two. And it's the whole of us. And this is very interesting because it sort of hints to that our will, my intention, my thinking ends in a body movement can be compared to process one and process two where the actual movement is the final result observable by you by me and it's the collapse collapse of the superposition whereas the body listen carefully before not in time but before is in a superposition they use chaos theory to show that the whole neurodynamical system is one and therefore when everything is collapsed there will be only one will but it makes room for several wills or attitudes before the collapse and that potentiality of wills I I see it as is the total body system and once we get integrated and more whole we will be able to harbor more potentialities there will be less of this tightening of our structure in a monosemic direction because a monosemic thing going on or only one intention going on before is not correct according to the double slit experiment neither is it correct according to a whole heap of uh, quantum physicists I won't mention all those but I have a paper here I will try to bring that up in a later lecture it's quite interesting how they reacted to the turmoil that was created from uh, the ones understandably who wants to cling to the monosemic worldview that this is an actuality I would say in quantum mechanics indicates that there is a potentiality whereas definitely Laplace means that this actuality excludes a before so he has a static worldview and we know that the Laplacian vision crashed 
with uh, Morrissey uh, and the MM experiment of 1887. It crashed completely. And it crashed further, 1925, and over and over again. So we have an empirical understanding that has been neglected for good reasons. We couldn't fit it into the current system. So before we had to abandon the real world, so to speak, and only have one worldview, the worldview of potentialities. And this is a way nobody wants to step in, not sincerely. But you can calculate that way. And this is what they have been doing up, up until now, more or less. And the staff shows this is not necessary anymore. We can, without the intellectual cheats, without denying science or anything like that, we can have the both, but we also need have the both. Both needs to come into the picture. It is very, very important. Otherwise, we do not follow the double slit experiment and we don't follow our own bodies because they are the other side of the coin, so to speak, or the other side of reality. We have an indeterminate process one, and that is the system in totality. Once we decided it would look like we have one thought that decided that I would raise this paper. Otherwise, nothing would make sense. And I think it's a pretty sure argument. Thank you very much. I think that would be enough for the day. It was rather complicated. And thank you very much for your patience. Maybe a little slow panorama, very slow, slow panorama of the surroundings here. Slow, slow, okay. Please. It's beautiful. Such a privilege to have the lecture here with such beautiful surroundings. Slowly, slow, okay. You can tell. Uh, we have some purple uh, roses there. Yes. Ah, Mr. Mm.